Hello and welcome to the Evolving Spiritual Practice Podcast. My name is Ralph Cree. This is brought to you in association with bodyheartmindspirit.co.uk. Today I spoke with Jude Curvin about her book, The Cosmic Hologram. Um, I'll just read uh, a little bit about her bio. <clears throat> She's had a very um, interesting life. Um, so Jude is a cosmologist, planetary healer, futurist, author, previously one of the most senior business women in the UK and co-founder of Whole World View. Having grown up as the daughter of a coal miner in the north of England, she's since journeyed to more than 80 countries around the world and for the last 25 years has lived in the sacred landscape of Avebury. She has experienced multi-dimensional realities since early childhood and worked with the wisdom keepers, both incarnate and discarnate of many traditions. Jude integrates leading edge science, research into consciousness and universal wisdom teachings into a holistic worldview. This underpins her work aimed at being transformational, enabling transformational and emergent resolutions <clears throat> to our collective planetary issues, raising awareness and empowering fundamental change and sustainability, sustainable solutions to global problems. She holds a PhD in archeology span from the University of Reading in the UK, researching ancient cosmologies and a master's degree in physics from Oxford University, specializing in cosmology and quantum physics. She's the author of six non-fiction books, um, currently available in 16 languages and 26 countries, including Cosmos, a co-creator's guide to the whole world, co-authored with Dr. Irvin Laszlo. Her first fictionalized ebook, Legacy, is available at Amazon. Her latest is The Cosmic Hologram. I, this, actually, this website's probably a bit out of date because I think that was uh, written a while back, but as the book I've read, and I think it's amazing, Cosmic Hologram, Information at the Centre of Creation, the first book of the Transformation Trilogy, and which won the Silver Nautilus Book Award for 2017. She's currently working, writing book two, Gaia, her story. Um, well, okay, this is a little bit more. Her international corporate career culminated in her being the group finance director of two major international businesses. She has extensive experience and knowledge of world events, international politics, and global economic and financial systems. And has spoken on transformational reforms in the UK, US, Europe, Japan, and South Korea. Yeah, so she is um, very, very interesting woman um, who weaves together lots of different uh, aspects of life and I think her book The Cosmic Hologram and the sort of story she tells about the nature of reality that's contained in that book is um, really revolutionary and uh, changed my life and uh, hope it does yours too. Hope you enjoy. Dr. Jude Curravan, welcome to the Evolving Spiritual Practice Podcast. Thank you, Ralph. It's my great pleasure to be with you today. Yeah, wonderful. And I, I, as I was saying before we started recording, I've been looking forward to this conversation for ages. Um, I think it was about a year ago I came across your work um, through a podcast, and then I watched all your videos online and listened to all your podcasts, and then I bought your book, The Cosmic Hologram. Um, and read that and I after that I was like I, I had so many questions about it and I thought it was it's uh was such a wonderful book and it was a, it was a kind of new story mm. of what the universe is and who, who we are and all of that kind of thing which I found very healing for me having grown up in the kind of scientific materialist mm. um, reductionist ed education I had in England uh, in the kind of 1980s and 1990s and that um so yeah it was it was a it was a very big moment for me and and, and just recently i interviewed bernardo castrop who is another uh, person who's sort of from the world of physics who's his uh the kind of story he's telling about what the nature of reality is again it was a very big 
moment for me. So it's kind of this 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 last month uh, interviewing you two has uh, been been really wonderful for me. Um, so just um, to give people a, a very very brief idea about who you are, your bio, because I in there's a lot of podcasts you've done and videos out there uh, that I would recommend people listen to, and you go into quite a lot of detail about your life and things in there. And uh, just being mindful of the the relatively short time we got together, uh, is it possible to do a little elevator speech about who you are just for to set the scene, please? I just say I'm someone who's been curious all my life. Yeah. And that started when I was four and started to have experiences that are way beyond the apparent normality of my life. And I've been walking between those sort of worlds ever since. And what I've realized in that lifelong journey is that we're now at a point in our collective human story where all the threads, all the paths that we seem to have walked to this point seem to be converging. So all the spiritual traditions, the wisdom teachings, the indigenous teachings, now science is also coming to the same realization of the deeper nature of reality. And it's a nature of reality that myself and many, many folks have sought and have experienced in lifetimes that go back thousands of years and traditions that go back thousands of years. So I think it's a very exciting time. And I'll stop there because I think this is a journey for all of us. It's not just my personal journey. Mm. And it's an opening and an invitation in my sense to come together to take these next steps of our human evolutionary journey uh, yeah. going forward. And that, that's very much the theme of this podcast is weaving all of these strands together, trying to integrate some kind of synthesis. Um, and one of the things I love about your life story is that you kind of represent that you, you're kind of you weave lots of different strands together you were uh, um you know have done a lot of training in the sort of hard sciences and physics at oxford and things like that and then had a very successful business career um and then you're also really into all this far out spiritual stuff uh, and you kind of effortlessly weave those those kind of three strands together in your life re really nicely um so so the, yeah, it's just as I was alluding to at the very beginning, the story we live in is really key, and the story we we kind of tell ourselves about what who we are, what reality is, what life's about, and your story that we might call the cosmic hologram is a really good one. Um, and the mainstream culture seems to be still running on the kind of Newtonian um, worldview, even though a lot of the physics you talk about has been around for over a hundred years, but it doesn't seem to have, you know, it's starting to emerge in uh, movies and things like that, but it doesn't seem to have like, you know, my education say in the 1980s and early 1990s, you know, was very much based in that kind of Newtonian thing and created the mind, the minds and the stories that we held as, as young people and growing into older people were shaped by that. And so I just, um, wonder if you could if you could just summarize what the cosmic hologram story is um just for us please yeah i'd be delighted to i'd like to just take a step back mm -hmm. and talk about the revolution in science that happened 100 years ago as you mentioned oh, yeah because then people were realizing that any any framework is only as good as the evidence that supports it and at the end of the 19th century folks were finding phenomena that couldn't be explained by that Newtonian framework of separate things. Um, and so that's really where the, the quantum revolution took, came forward because they realized at the very small scales of, of our universe, that things behave what was perceived as being counterintuitive. In other words, you know, things weren't separate. They were clearly relational, deeply involved. Um, and an observer would, could actually bring a quantum phenomenon into being. Um, and at the same time that that was going on, Einstein, of course, came along and said, well, actually, we can't consider space and time to be separate from each other. They have to come together as space time if we're going to understand our universe at all. Now, that was amazing. But two things happened or didn't happen. One was that the deeper understanding of reality and the nature of consciousness was just pushed to the side. 
So any terms of spirituality or that experience uh, of spirituality, we're just going to push to the side. The other thing is that for the for the, for the you know for our collective understanding, these revolutions were happening either at incredibly small scales or very big scales. So what did it have to do with our everyday lives? You know, if you're a science nerd like I suspect you are and I am, then it's all. Oh, I've got to, I've got to, for the record, I'm not a science nerd. I I'm scientifically challenged. If anything. Ah, so. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I come from this much more from the arts, the arts and spirituality Excellent. side of things. Um, although, although I'm fascinated by science, but I, I got to say, um, you know, it's not. I'm not talented in that area of life. That's great because neither are the vast majority of people really, mm, yeah. although many are interested, but basically because the quantum revolution and the relativity revolution were happening at tiny or huge scales, they really weren't impacting people's lives, yeah. except through the technologies that came from them. So that whole revolution, which actually really begged the question about the deeper nature of reality, that deeper question was pushed to the side and technology took over, and that's where we've come the last hundred years. But we're now in a situation where, again, we're discovering phenomena that can't be understood within that framework of 20th century science. And this has come forward over in the last few years, and it's come forward because when we look at black holes, you know, those amazing extreme events in our universe where a massive star at the end of its life uses up its fuel, can't sustain itself anymore and collapses inward. And the gravity is so strong that the collapse doesn't stop. It actually falls in, um, you know, beyond what's called an event horizon where light itself can't escape. So it looks black. But cosmologists like myself are looking at that and saying, well, what happened to all that information? that was held in the star. And what we found is that it didn't disappear. Instead, rather like on the surface of a, a balloon, it's held on that event horizon. And that raised some very deep questions. And over the last few years, that's led to a complete under revolutionary understanding of the nature of our universe as being, wait for it, holographic, but also that the energy and matter of 20th century science and quantum physics and the space time of 20th century relativity theories are themselves now seeing, being seen to be just the appearance of a universe that arises from deeper levels of causation. And that's where we can no longer exclude the nature of consciousness. That's where no longer can we push to the side the wisdom teachings and spiritually based teachings that talk about a much grander wholeness of the nature of reality. And again, where our physical world is an appearance of a reality that is essentially much deeper. So we're at that point now where instead of a, a scientific breakthrough that either is just of interest to scientists or just taking place at the very small or the very big, which is outside our everyday lives, what we're now discovering is at every scale of existence and across many, many different fields of research. And what it's showing, I feel, could actually usher a transformation in our worldview far more significant than we've actually ever undertaken before. And that's a big deal. Yeah. And this big deal is based on evidence. It's not based on a, some ideas or a theory. And it converges. It brings all those paths and threads we spoke about of all the wisdom teachings and traditions together now with leading edge science into this integrated whole worldview that I hope will give us authentic hope for the future mm. and empower us in coming together um, so one of the things you you were, you were talking to about there was in, was information, and this was one one of the things I picked up from your book was that you were saying that um, information is more fundamental than space time and subatomic particles and things like that. And the question I had after reading your book is, 
well, this is what I really wanted to ask you. And I'm so glad this is the moment I get to ask you this question is how, how do you define information? Okay. Well, we're having this conversation through technology that uses digitized information. In other words, information made up of ones and zeros. So um, your name, Ralph, can be translated into a whole series of ones and zeros. Okay, my name, Jude, can. So can my image, so can your voice. So what our communication technologies do is they take images, they take sounds, they take meaningful information, such as words and sentences and stories, and they translate them into this language of digits, of digits of ones and zeros, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then what happens is when my image is translated through the camera in my laptop into a whole string of ones and zeros, it gets squirted down through the internet, comes into your room and your laptop and again then gets retranslated into my image vice versa okay that's what our human technologies our, our digitized technologies do what we've discovered not just a, a you know cosmologists but we're discovering this in evolutionary biology we're discovering you know in in the shapes of clouds and ecosystems and the underlying patterns of the internet and, and human collective behaviors is that the appearance of our universe, that energy and matter and space time of itself is made up, literally made up of digitized information. And I put a hyphen in it because sometimes we think of information as just raw data or another level of, of, of up from that. What I'm talking about is a universe whose fundamental stuff is meaningful in hyphen formation that literally informs the entire appearance of our world. And our universe does it much more smartly than we humans do because our human languages have alphabets that range from, I think, 12 letters to something like 54 letters. And our English language has 26. Our universe just has two. Yeah. Our universal language literally are ones and zeros, but from, the, from those ones and zeros at the most minute scale of our entire universe, which is as small as to an atom as the atom is to the entire universe, that alphabet, just as in our technologies, makes up, is, is brought together to accumulate into atoms and molecules and ultimately planets and plants and people and galaxies and the whole universe so it's innately meaningful yeah. because our universe is meaningful but does so noughts and ones arranged in whatever configuration without interaction with consciousness is just a string of zeros and ones it's kind of yeah. um you might call it, it you might call it data rather than information so um, a, a universe without consciousness in it, which is part, you know, that's kind of the story, that's part of the story that's been told to a lot of us, you know, in our lives, living, growing up in the West, uh, with, with a kind of um, not very good understanding of science, that, that consciousness is an illusion and, and that kind of, it, it doesn't really belong in the universe. So that's the kind of, that, that dead, meaningless, data-filled universe but then so when you're talking to me about the stream of ones and zeros coming through the internet from you to me it's the consciousness uh that you and i share that turns that data into information is that it's much much bigger than that no. the whole universe is conscious yeah so that's so i go referring back to those who might be listening to this who might also listen to my conversation with bernardo and um, i mean i it become convinced um you know through listening to his stuff and and and, and practicing non-dual tantra um Absolutely. you know for a long time that um the the, the, the consciousness is is it i mean this is this everything is consciousness exactly. and yeah and that there's what you, uh, bernardo calls it mind at large that there's there's a, a sort of a, a single uh 
consciousness you know living this and and obviously we we can access that in our in our in our own subjectivity and that's kind of blended well blended with our individuality and this is one of the things that uh, i wanted to refer back to this languaging thing that we don't really have a word in our language that's a good one for this coincidence of that universal mind and our individual mind because in our, our own first person experience we can we can act we, we can feel simultaneously the, the the kind of the fact of our subjective experience contains this kind of universal mind and also the kind of particularized aspect and tim freak has come up with a word individual which i think is quite a good one but nice. we don't have one in common parlance um you know the, the ancient indian languages had lots of different words for different states of consciousness for example and we're quite impoverished in in english um i've kind of lost my lost my track there oh yeah so you were saying it's much bigger of it that, that there's the the information is you know if you and i are not here having this conversation that, that there's still conscious the, the consciousness is uh the kind of elemental substance of um yeah i mean yes the universe at large yes what i would say is that first of all uh, the Edwardian uh, philosopher, Sir James Jeans, said that in his perspective, our universe is more a great thought than a great thing. And as cosmologists, we're realizing that indeed it is. Our universe is a finite thought form in an infinite and eternal um, cosmos, as Einstein would have called it, cosmic mind. So our entire universe exists and evolves as a unified, conscious entity. And it's really been doing that for the last 13.8 billion years from its original simplicity, exquisitely fine-tuned, but exquisitely ordered, uh, but with an innate evolutionary impulse to evolve from simplicity to complexity and ever greater levels of individual self-awareness. So I talk of us as being microcosmic co-creators with our universe. But if we weren't here, you know, more and more exobiologists are finding ostensibly habitable, and by habitable, I mean for biological organisms, habitable, although rare, still with the great profusion of our universe and the great profusion of galaxies, that there is an almost unavoidable, overwhelming likelihood that other self-aware beings are having similar conversations mm -hmm. <laughs> in other planets and other star systems and other galaxies. So this individuation of the whole of the universe's conscious experience and evolutionary impulse is finding expression in us. But if we didn't, if we weren't here, the universe's conscious evolutionary arc would still continue. Mm. And consciousness, yes, mind and consciousness aren't something we have. All the evidence now is pointing to is that they literally are what we and the whole world are. Yeah. And so one thing you said is uh, in your book is that um, you're just alluding to there, that the universe kind of e exists to evolve from simplicity to complexity. And but you've also said that all of the um stuff has been there from the beginning and and it's no more stuff has been created it's it, uh, this might be a misunderstanding that it, uh, this, this was my understanding of it and okay. and, and maybe you, you can correct it that um so what i would imagine there is that it's not that more things have been created in terms of co uh, complicatedness but it's the complexity of the relationships that um had uh so if i was thinking of like a, a room full of people sitting there doing nothing versus a room full of people creating a theatrical production and then so you know you haven't added more people you've just added the complexity of the relationship with these people they've created the theatrical production people want to come and watch that they're sort of drawn towards that complexity they won't don't want to come and watch people sitting around doing nothing and uh, you know think is that yeah? So have I completely missed what? what no, you're, I think you're it's actually I think it's a lovely metaphor. I just perhaps tweak it a little bit. Mm. 
and have a sense that right at the beginning of our universe, instead of people, think hydrogen atoms. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that over time, those hydrogen atoms began to come together in and form stars. And those stars then came to, you know, as they um, lived their lives, they were undertaking this amazing alchemical process of creating heavier and heavier and heavier elements. And when those stars died, and, and if they were very big, and the early ones were, they exploded. All of those elements were spread around the interstellar space. And over generations of stars, those elements found each other in interstellar dust clouds and started to come together in more complexity as prebiotic molecules, the building blocks of organic life. And then planetary systems formed and planets formed like our planetary home, Gaia, as homes for even more complexity. So it's as though those people in that room 13.8 billion years ago, yeah, mm -hmm. decided to start coming together and having conversations and relationships. And those relationships in, in sort of our universal terms were atoms to molecules ultimately then to, to stars and galaxies and planets and people and onward. And of course, this is also happening, not just in the, within the energy, matter and space time of the appearance of our universe, but that our universe exists and evolves as a, a unified entity. So all the time that this beautiful evolutionary process is ongoing, the universe knows itself in its wholeness. And that's why I also talk about the universe not beginning in the implied chaos of the Big Bang. But as you understand, uh, Ralph, the, the ancient Vedic tradition was of the breath of Brahman. So I talk about the big breath and the ongoing big breath mm. where space expands and time flows. And so although the energy matter, all the energy matter in our universe was there at the get go and has just changed its form ever since, that flow of time and expansion of space has enabled more and more informational content to be experienced and embodied within our universe. And that is the informational complexity that we're playing out. So it's like those folks, you know, they came together and they've made a play together or, or some music together or an artwork together. So that is the representation from them sitting in a room and moving forward and finding ever more complex, dynamic ways to experience and evolve. So another thing which I've probably misunderstood and, and hopefully you can tweak here is the way I kind of imagined what you were describing about this one aspect of this cosmic hologram was there was a like a kind of an, a membrane an, an expanding membrane that as it expands it uh, gathers more information that sort of now this is the bit where i'm probably going to be well it sort of projects inside itself a holographic um kind of projection um what you've des described as a kind of a, a, a holographic virtual reality pixelated at the planck scale I don't know. I'm probably conflating loads of things here, and uh, and uh, and hopefully your unpacking of it will help the understanding of people listening to this because they might. Have, um, so the, the first thing was this kind of the the expand. Well, the first thing I can't let this one fly by that you said that the the universe is finite. So I, for most of my life, I've been wondering, you know, is the universe infinite or finite? Both options blow my mind, um, and. So I don't know whether we could just address perhaps the, 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 the finiteness of the universe. And then if you could just address that, this thing of why like I was talking about the, the expanding um, expansion, mm -hmm. uh, collection, collecting the information on this kind of membrane thing. But also you've talked about the universe being 2D uh, right. and okay. flat. Let's, let's so plan. there's there's a, there's I've just dumped a whole load there for you uh, and, <laughs> you and I remember when you when you said uh, in this book that that the universe is probably flat and two-dimensional I was like 
whoa I, I i kind of felt a bit funny even contemplating that so um there's a there's a whole i've just dumped a whole basket of stuff for you to unpack uh, okay you know, well, let, let's that will help people understand it <laughs> okay what this new understanding does is it brings together a few basic um attributes of our universe that we we've discovered we've measured we understand okay and the two that i really want to focus on is that information meaningful information is the fundamental stuff of our universe okay it is more fundamental as i mentioned than the energy matter and space time appearance of our universe so how does cosmic mind articulating its its consciousness create a universe okay and it does that in a way that is actually as simple as it could be but no simpler so what happened 13.8 billion years ago is that the infinite infinite and eternal cosmic mind the cosmic plenum the ground of all being began to have a thought and it probably has many 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 thoughts but we don't have access to those many, many, many thoughts at the moment, but we do have access to the great thought that is our universe. So we know that it began 13.8 billion years ago. And as I say, it wasn't this implied chaos of a big bang. It was minute, but it was much more ordered. So literally at that moment, space, time, energy, matter of our universe came into its appearance. And ever since then, space has expanded, as we know from our measurements. Time has flowed because it began in such an ordered state. There's a law of thermodynamics that talks about, you know, it can only get, it can only get more complex. It can only get more and more information content through time. And therefore it gives a one dimensional, sorry, a one directional flow of time. You know, the arrow of time within space time. What we now know as well from our study of black holes is that all of the information that was held in the star that became a black hole isn't proportional to its three dimensionality, it's, it's a sphere. So you'd think that the, 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 the bigger the sphere, that the information will be proportional to its 3D-ness, yeah? Just as if we had a book and the writing on it, the font was the same. If we expanded the number of pages, and the size of the book, the information in it would be represented by the volume of the book, yeah? Mm -hmm. But when we study black holes, we realize that wasn't the case. Instead, the information was proportional to the surface area of that spherical black hole. And people started to sense, well, where have we seen this before? And of course, the answer was a hologram. Because when we create a hologram, a human hologram, we bounce light off a three-dimensional object and collect the information of its appearance. And we actually put all of that information on a two-dimensional pattern. And then we shine light through it, and there's a holographic projection through that pattern, picking up all the information that pattern holds but actually projecting a three-dimensional appearance of that original object. So when cosmologists took this understanding of information, black hole information, they expanded it to our entire universe and realized that the appearance of the 3D appearance of our universe is a projection, this time of consciousness, from its boundary of what we call space and they actually call it a brain b-r-a-n-e okay so it is a membrane but it's often reduced to being called a brain but it's that think of a balloon and what you have as oh, a balloon blows up that surface area is the brain is the, is the boundary of what we call space and it's from that boundary that all the information that continues to increase through the flow of time and as space expands, that boundary expands so it can hold more and more information, then is projected as the apparent 3D-ness of our universe. And that's what's called the, the, the holographic principle. So when we combine the holographic principle 
of this projected, and it's real. I'm not saying it's not real. I'm saying it's very real. But because it's projected as part of a universe that exists and evolves as a unified entity, just as that balloon does, then nothing is separate. Everything is not just interrelated and interdependent, but into being. I was just reading that word this morning. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh coined that, I believe, into being. Yeah, as, as, a, as, a, as a kind of a, a tweak on the, the term interconnectedness. It's, it's slightly more true. It takes yeah. it deeper. Mm. And, it's, and it's, yeah. it's deeper and it's truer. Yeah. Because we literally are all of us. You know, the, the other thing to say before we move on is that the wonderful nature of a hologram is that the whole is replicated in its every little pixelated part. Mm. So for our universe, the wholeness of it is again reflected in every constituent part. But of course, those parts scale up, scale down, but they also are nested patterns of greater complexity. So we get an atom to a molecule, a molecule eventually to a cell, a cell to an organ, an organ to an organism, an organism to an ecosystem, and, you know, the whole planetary basis to and, and beyond. So we have this incredible nested complexity, but the wholeness of our universe is essentially reflected in every part. And we, as its microcosmic co-creators, have access mm. to the wholeness of its consciousness. Yeah, and that, so that brings me to another thing which appears in your book quite a lot, fractals. Yeah. And um, I have done a fair amount of psychedelics in my life and seen a lot of fractals. So fractals are very much part of the psychedelic culture yeah. and uh you know in different states of consciousness you literally see fractals mm -hmm. with you know visually see fractals but it's not just that kind of objective seeing you understand the subjective uh nature of of that fractal so you know when you're thinking of um say the fractal nature of coastlines or trees or something like that that's a kind of an objective version of it but you can also if from my own experience i can intuit like what you were just saying that my subjectivity is a fractal a self similar to that larger subjectivity of the mind at large you know the the cosmic mind or something and um and i think that bringing subjectivity and consciousness back into the picture from having grown up in a very materialist uh worldview and that idea you know you, when you that fractals as being a kind of like a pretty pattern and, and that kind of thing but there's a deep truth uh, to, uh on a subjective level to fractals um too that i i really um know we can experience ourselves and it makes sense it feels i mean again this is the sort of thing that the, the sort of hard, I mean, hard science in inverted commas thing of, of my upbringing would say, you can't say things like that. That's ridiculous. That's anthropomorphizing the universe. It's the cardinal sin. Um, so, um, you know, what you've, you've talked, you talk a lot about fractals in, in, in your book. And oh, the, the last thing I wanted to say about fractals. Is, so even though I have, have not, got a very good and uh, understanding of, of science it was something I was never very um, good, you know never performed very well in in my life but when I saw fractals mm. and when I heard you talking about the cosmic hologram I recognized uh, the importance and meaning of it um, which was really exciting for me it, it, you know to, to understand the maths of fractals is way beyond me and the, the average person but you see fractals and you understand what it's what it is and I th this kind of visual mathematics is um, really interesting but the fact that it appears so frequently in the natural world um, is an astonishing fact and the fact that you can actually perceive it in different states of consciousness and then this mathematical 
version was created that uh, that we can now see on our computers and with the the, the animations and things you can zoom in and out of. It, it's all very, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more than interesting, actually. I think it's fundamental. Mm. That's what we're realizing that the, the, the way in which consciousness, cosmic consciousness, co creates our universe is from these underlying causative realms where fractal patternings and, 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 and so called attractors are the basic dynamic interrelationships within that unified reality that then emerge as the appearance of our universe at all scales of, of, ex, of existence. And this is, I think, what's so important now because we're getting the evidence at all scales of existence. We're finding that, for example, when an atom changes from being an insulator to a metal, the electrons cluster in fractal patterns. We find fractal patterns, as you say, in ecosystems, coastlines, clouds, everything we look at, we find fractal patterns and harmonic relationships and resonances throughout our solar system. We find it throughout um, the way that galaxies form and clusters of galaxies. And we've actually found the same fractal patterns, which are signatures of the cosmic hologram um, in patterns that pervade the whole of space. About 400,000 years after the first moment of the big breath, space cooled down enough that it became transparent to light. Before that, it wasn't, but it was transparent to sound. So just as the ancient tradition of this primordial om, we, we now realize cosmologically that indeed our early universe was pervaded by these sounds, these pulsing sounds of a primordial om that lasted nearly 400,000 years. But after that, when space expanded and cooled down enough, it was transparent to light. And we now can see that relic light, that relic radiation from that very early epoch. And we can see tiny little temperature fluctuations in it throughout the whole of space. And when we analyze those fluctuations in what's called the cosmic microwave background, they're fractal. And we discovered that, we measured that in 2017. So the other thing to say is not only therefore do these patterns holographically scale up and scale down from every scale of existence, but they're not just throughout the natural world. The same patterns that underpin ecosystems underpin the internet. They underpin the way that we use our mobile phones, for goodness sake. I think you it's even said that... Uh the people taking library books out yeah it is a fractal pattern yeah. yeah and we've got you know we've got peer-reviewed research for this it's not just whatever it's yeah. all the things that i i refer to in the cosmic hologram are actually peer-reviewed research but the other thing as well is that you know and again i wrote about this in the book when we look at the underlying informational patterns that play out in the frequency for example and destructive power of earthquakes yeah we find exactly the same relationships play out in terms of the frequency and the number of fatalities number of deaths in human conflicts which says if there's an underlying attractor for earthquakes and for human conflicts then there's also the potential for an underlying attractor of human consciousness um, emerging peacefully. This is the point. Everything is consciousness. So in our collective psyche, our patterning is whatever our collective worldview is, our collective mindset, because our worldview and our mindset sets drive our behaviours in the main. And we do have a collective dis-ease of the appearance of separation. So uh, fractals being a kind of given, uh, that, that's, that's the fundamental attractor of everything. Well, uh, there, are well they, they, the, the, there are other patterns. There are other patterns, but they're okay. very, very pervasive. Very pervasive. So if, so we are living fractally most all of us without necessarily realizing that yeah 
Um, so if we were to consciously realize that and that became part of our culture, it was just, you know, you, you meet your granny for tea and you, you it's like, instead of saying good morning, it's like, you know, you say something like, oh, you know, I fractally um, welcome you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it just became part of our common story that fractals was a thing um a, a, a significant thing and, and, and a kind of not as you say not the underlying factor but but an extremely pervasive thing you know, how would that how's that going to change us i don't think so i don't think that's the real key to changing us mm. i think it's very important what you said about experiencing reality in altered states as that fractal those fractal patterns because of course the key thing about fractals is their relationships and what they show us is that everything in existence is in relationship with everything else. And that's more fundamental in a way than the patterns themselves, is that ev there is nothing that is separable. We are literally inseparable from the whole of our universe. And so we are informational receivers, transceivers, whether we're aware of it or not, as microcosms, as like cells in the body of our entire universe. And I think that's the more fundamental realization that, you know, and even when we talk about spirituality, there's a sense of somehow it's mind, body, spirit. And what we're being shown as that everything in existence and the nature of reality itself is that there are permeable boundaries and that the entire the entirety of consciousness is really more a piano keyboard, you know, where there are low notes and middle notes and higher notes, but they're all part of this unified nature of reality. And that itself, that nature of reality is multidimensional, which is where, as we go into altered states, we're also naturally able to access information that you know in our everyday way of being we just we just do this and do this really you know um i would i often say that intuition is our is our superpower mm. and it is but how often do we do we trust our intuition but our intuition is that resonant knowing well, and that's very much one of the perils of this kind of worldview where there's no place for consciousness and intuition and those kind of things as kind of dirty words Absolutely. and and you know that's one of the things that's so great about this different type of story you're telling and um, that, that's rooted in evidence you know it's, it's very much Absolutely. to do with with the evidence of physics and biology and chemistry and 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 that but it, it's it's uh telling a different story um about that um i'm just conscious of our time i just there's this a couple of let's see if there's a couple of questions that i really wanted to explore with you okay well here it, so here's one um the relationship seems to be a, a key aspect to reality and so when we talk about uh, everything you know it's quite common in spirituality for people to talk about everything being one or a singleness um a unity unification um but what I'm hearing you talking about, and that, that's not my own, that, that's one part of it, the story as far as I see it, but there's, but there's this, uh, the relationship is, is, is a key element and, and, and uh, that's where so much meaning is. And that, from what I'm hearing you saying that the, the, sort of the one and zero is, is as simple as you can get it in terms of relationship and that that's, the sort of necessary gradient for evolution to happen if there you know a, 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 a true singleness wouldn't give rise to evolution because there's no relationship there absolutely i mean that the tao talks about this it says in in the beginning is the one the one becomes two the two becomes three and from the three ten thousand things are born and so unity is not uniformity unity expresses itself in radical diversity 
you know, we only have to think of, 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 the, of every snowflake being different, every leaf on every tree being different. You know, the universe, as, as it as it's, as it's moves through its evolutionary impulse from simplicity to complexity, is also a story of, of differentiation and diversity. And yet it is all in relationship. Yeah, but I think it's really important that we don't confuse unity with uniformity. Yeah, yeah. But what we've done in a way, we've taken it to the other extreme and we've we've actually brought into this illusion of separation rather than the reality of that unity expressed in its diversity, its differentiation, in its holographic holons and fractals and, and relationships. Mm. As there's a dist- I like that distinction between separateness and relationship. Like relationship has it has a sense of meaning and yes. uh, um, wholesomeness, um, aliveness, whereas separateness has this a kind of cold feeling, uh, death, um, you know, isolation. It kind of has those connotations to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think the other big misunderstanding, not misunderstanding, but the other big um, transformation in our worldview is in terms of evolution itself, and especially in terms of the evolution of, of biological organisms such as ourselves, because, of course, the prevailing paradigm is that evolution is driven by what's called random mutations. And then those random mutations are sort of tested against an environment and those that are are most beneficial continue and those that aren't die out. But we now know that evolution abhors random mutations, that when a cell or an organism decides to express its DNA, that DNA is not unchanging. It can be expressed, that genome, that, that manual for building an organism um, is, is in dynamic relationship with the rest of the organism all the time in every cell and throughout the body. But what happens is the way that those genes are expressed are in, again, relational, dynamic relationship with the rest of the organism and the environment. It's always an ongoing relational, informational communication. So random mutations seem to happen about one in every 10,000 copies when um, when the D, the DNA is 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 is, um, is is expressed but what the cell does then it goes through the most incredible complexity to reduce that number of random mutations so that instead of one in 10,000 they're more like one in 10 billion because the vast majority of random mutations are not beneficial. So what we're finding is that evolution isn't driven in that way. It's far more guided, intelligently guided and relational within an organism and between an organism and its wider environment, which itself is fully relational. The whole of our planetary home, Gaia, is in such relationship at all scales of existence. So this isn't just rewriting and transforming our mindset in terms of cosmology and the nature of reality and consciousness. It's also rewriting the story of evolution, Mm. the biological evolution. The story of us is being rewritten as well. So on on that point, I think uh, I'll I'll ask one more question, uh, given given your time limit. Um, so thinking of, of the evolution of scientific concepts that, you know, what you and I have been discussing in this conversation is an evolution from that kind of 20th century science. And you've been talking about ones and zeros and this sort of digitized digital ocean that makes up reality or the universe. Is that not merely uh, so you know the, the the there was a kind of victorian mechanistic so machines were becoming part of human culture civilization industrial revolution then you get this kind of mechanized metaphor for the universe now we're in a kind of uh, digital information age with ones and zeros and all of that and 
what you're describing seems to uh, play off it, it, that kind of metaphor of of where of the information age we're living in, and um, given that the history of science has been these evolving kind of worldviews, looking into the future, do you think? I mean that. Uh, I suppose evolution tends to doesn't get rid of what's come before it kind of enfolds it within itself so this picture of ones and zeros and a digital uh, reality um, might become part of future scientific worldview um, but what we're looking at now is not the end game uh, does that make any sense yeah of course and it never is the end game but what I would say now two things. First of all, this isn't just about the science, the leading edge scientific discoveries that are showing us this. This is converging with wisdom teachings, um, universal wisdom teachings and traditions, indigenous teachings of thousands of years. So there is a convergence here and an integration here that is more than what science has done since its inception. Because science at its inception was always pretty much forced to be separate from the deeper understanding of, of what we've come to term um, spirituality, okay? But what it's done of itself, therefore, is, is the two have been separate, and therefore spirituality itself has essentially been seen as separate, as I said, mind, body, spirit. So we've had this divergence, and now we've got this convergence, where first of all, spirituality isn't something different it's part of our everyday um, perspective of who we are as human beings. Secondly, science isn't telling a story that's any longer different from what our deeper experiential understanding and our, our, our universal wisdom understanding is telling us. It's convergent and integral. And thirdly, yes, it appears to be a sort of a, a, a modern metaphor. But what I find and what I found in all my life of exploring the nature of consciousness and ancient wisdom is that of itself is not a part. You know, the understanding we have and the technologies that have come forward through our collective psyche have actually come about in part because our collective psyche is able to understand this progressive emergent perception of the nature of reality so we're using language which is common to this if you like in part at least to the technology but the deeper understanding which i think is absolutely fundamental comes back to what we we're saying earlier that mind and consciousness aren't what we have they are literally what we and the whole world are and that's not a technological perspective yeah and if if the universe is finite, what's the end game? Well, what I did with the cosmic hologram, but my forthcoming book, The Story of Gaia, takes further and has as an appendix what I call a new insight of informational science. And what we now understand is when we restate what are three fundamental laws of our universe, which are called thermodynamics, they're all about energy, the states of, of, of the appearance of our universe, the third law is really important. The first law talks about energy matter and now information expresses energy matter. That's quantum physics. The second law talks about how the informational content of our universe increases through time. That happens to be a description of relativity. But the third law is the clincher because what the third law of thermodynamics relates is temperature and information content. So our universe began at its highest temperature and its lowest information content. And ever since the space has expanded and time has flowed, its temperatures reduced as its information contents increased. So we're now at a situation where the temperature of space is very low. It's only 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. Whereas it began in a temperature that is so high, it literally is, let's see, something like a billion, trillion, trillion degrees. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. 
so we've had this situation so the finiteness is when its temperature when space continues to expand and its temperature reduces to close to or very close to absolute zero because that's when its cycle has come to its maximum mm. informational content and then perhaps like a bubble of wisdom a bubble of consciousness it just whoo, dissolves into the infinity and eternity of the cosmic plenary but that information wouldn't be lost. No, it just no. goes back to the, it goes back to what it already knows it, which is the infinity of, of the cosmos. It's mm. not lost in that sense. It informs future universes. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Well, thank you, Jude. Uh, I mean, I feel like we've squeezed a lot in to that one hour there. Um, um, Thank you so much. I, it's so generous of you to to give this this time, um, to to share this story and with with other people, and uh, and I hope my misunderstandings of it and your corrections of you know serve serve people. I I'm I'm totally not afraid of uh, being a fool in public, <laughs> for the benefit of other people. And yeah. and I have to say I'm not either. So that makes two of us. Yeah. Oh, so in terms of people finding out more about your work where's the best place for them to go probably a website which is www.whole w-h-o-l-e world w-o-r-l-d hyphen view v-i-e-w.org and that's you know that that really is the whole sort of um way in which we we sort of share these the this new narrative this unitive narrative and beyond um people can pre if you're in the states you can pre-order my new book, The Story of Gaia Now. If not, if you're in the UK or elsewhere, the pre-order will come up soon and it's out at the end of the year. And as you say, you know, there's a lot of, of stuff on YouTube and elsewhere. But I think whole worldview is important because that's for everyone. And it's, and it's really an invitation for people not just to understand this new unitive narrative, as it were, but to experience it. And to link yeah. up and lift up together to, to, to do that. Um, and we work with a lot of partners globally. So they're also on the website. So there's a whole sort of treasure trove and an invitation to an adventure uh, that yeah. that website shares. Yeah. And to, to, to enact this story. Absolutely. It's not it's not just something to think about or no, no, no. talk about. It's uh, got to be lived. Yeah, it's got to be lived, experienced yeah. and embodied, because it seems to me, as we were saying earlier, you know, our collective dis-ease is materialism and separation. And mm. this is, is a, 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 a new story that gives us authentic hope. It empowers us. And it literally comes together with this, this amazing convergence of so many paths through so many years to show us that we are meaningful and purposeful microcosms of a meaningful and purposeful and evolutionary and conscious universe great well a deep bow to you jude you've been a great inspiration to me and a wonderful human being and um i look forward to reading more of your books and exploring more of your work thank you so much ralph and back at you yeah, for doing you. all that you're doing in the world thank you so much bye 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 I made all the music that I use in my podcasts. If you'd like to hear more of my music, please visit SoundCloud and check out my profile, Ralph Crew.